The Christ in me beholds the Christ in you. Any of you remember the soundtrack to Jaws? Okay. Okay. I'm very much attuned to the soundtrack of movies that have been memorable in my, in my life. Okay. Just when you thought it was safe to enter the water, sharks. Now, a shark is, of course, we know what a shark is, a large carnivorous fish. Almost all sharks live in the ocean, and while most of them are predators, it's interesting that the very largest sharks feed on plankton and tiny little fish eggs. There are over 400 species of shark, but only four have ever harmed humans. Nevertheless, people have been afraid of these large, powerful animals for quite some time. Actually, what I read is that in the United States, there are just 16 shark attacks each year, and less than one shark attack fatality. It came alive. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's cool. Meanwhile, in the coastal U.S. states alone, lightning, it says, strikes and kills more than 41 people a year. So actually, it goes to show that Sharks enjoy a reputation that is arguably more fearsome than their bite. The media can have a voracious appetite for shark bite movies. Anybody watch what, they, what was that called? Sharknado? There was a whole series of Sharknado things. I just saw that in passing to find something else good to watch. Sharknado movies. Okay. That was the dumbest thing. Okay. Sharks <laughs> flying on the land, chomping people that flying. Okay. Uh, you know, I did have to keep checking back every now and then. <laughs> oh, that was awful. <laughs> uh, and actually, in 2001, Time Magazine uh, uh, had a cover, and it said, The Summer of the Shark. There was an explosion of shark attack hype, and uh, it, herald, uh, it was heralded in the Time Magazine. And it was 30 years ago that the blockbuster movie Jaws brought the terror of shark attack to movie theaters. The record-breaking film directed by Steven Spielberg was based on a best-selling book by Peter Benchley. It grossed nearly $130 million, U.S. dollars, okay, in the United States alone. The movie arguably made sharks public enemy number one. And I also read something interesting that actually um, <clears throat> Peter Benchley's uh, book was based on a series of shark attacks that occurred in New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey, okay, and uh, in Long Branch, okay, uh, and there was another town there, that, uh, and I forget the year, uh, but it was uh, the book and then the movie were actually based on actual events that were happening on the Jersey Shore. This is why I'd never learned to swim. I have a reason for that, okay? though I didn't think of that when I tried three times at the Y taking lessons. Okay? I never thought about sharks, but now I'm glad that I didn't learn how to swim. Okay? Uh, but a shark can also be a type of person. A shark can be somebody who's unusually skilled. They're sharp, like uh, a, a, a pool shark or a card shark, and they really know their craft. Uh, the, the article that I read said that because of our dislike and fear of sharks, we have given the word shark a negative connotation. So rather than thinking of a shark as somebody unusually skilled, we think of them as somebody who's a cheat, a sneak, okay? somebody who, uh, who attacks, somebody who goes for what they want no matter what. Okay. Um, and so mostly to call somebody a shark is a derogatory uh, expression. A person who's thought to be a cheat or a chisel, isn't that interesting, a chisel, uh, is one who engages in deceitful behavior, in fraud or they practice trickery. And just when you thought it was safe to enter the water, sharks. This message is about how to handle sharks in the waters of our own life experiences. We all have people and things and situations and aspects of our ego self that, uh, that cause us to feel as if we're being attacked.
attacked, that cause us to feel boxed in and, uh, and that we are not free to experience the good that we desire in our lives. We may even feel like we are being attacked by these opposing forces. A shark can symbolize anything that we believe opposes our good or offers resistance to the changes that we desire to make in our life. The presence of sharks may cause us to have a wilderness experience. Now I'm mixing different contexts here. Sharks and the water of life, and now the wilderness or desert experience that some of us go through. A wilderness experience is usually thought of as a tough time in a person's life, especially a student of truth. Uh, we endure trials and discomfort. The pleasant things of life are things we can't seem to enjoy. They seem to elude us. Or these good things may be absent altogether. But in any case, we feel a discouragement, a lack of encouragement. A wilderness experience is often a time of intensified temptation and also spiritual attack. It can involve a spiritual or financial or emotional drought. Having a wilderness experience, it's time, it's, it is actually, though, if you think about it, and we mostly think of these things as negative, actually, these things can be thought of as challenging us to grow. And in that sense, they bring a benefit. The wilderness experience is often linked to a mountaintop experience. That is, we experience a struggle after we have experienced something good, something momentous in our lives. And this is what Jesus experienced. We understand in the fourth chapter of Matthew, uh, third chapter of Luke, and Mark's story in the first chapter, that Jesus, uh, when he began his ministry, he first went to the River Jordan and was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And scripture tells us this marvelous thing happened at that time. When Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens opened up, and a dove came out and rested on him, and he heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. And then something strange kind of happens with that story. Scripture, scripture tells us that the Spirit booted him into the wilderness. Now, you know, when I, years ago when I heard this story, I thought, why would the Spirit force him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil or Satan? <clears throat> but it makes a lot of sense if you think about it spiritually. Unity's understanding that the devil or Satan that this is not a being out there, you know, with the horns and the tail and carrying the pitchfork and that kind of thing. But um, <clears throat> the devil or Satan are the things that we fear. These are things inside of us. These are uh, negative traits, anger, jealousy. Uh, these are within us. And the inner Christ gives us the power to cast these experiences these emotions, these kinds of thoughts out of our consciousness. <laughs> and so Jesus experienced the temptations of Satan, or we might say the temptation to use his spiritual gifts and abilities in negative or selfish ways. Uh, one of the, the first temptations was to change the stones into bread because he had been fasting for 40 days and he was hungry. And he refused to do this. Uh, and he quoted scripture, Old Testament, to the devil. And I thought it was always interesting that the devil or Satan knew scripture, knew the Bible, because it quotes a little later on something to Jesus. And uh, the second temptation, now Luke and, and Matthew kind of they switch up, in other words, in one, it's the, the high temple and Satan offering the world, which is the second one. And in Matthew, it is 
taking Jesus to uh, a, a pinnacle and telling him that he should jump down because the Old Testament says that, uh, that God has given the angels charge over him. And if he should so much as stumble, they will keep him from uh, stubbing his toe. And so this temptation is one that Jesus responds to Satan. Remember, Satan is quoting Old Testament. And Jesus responds with another scripture that says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord, or test the Lord thy God. Uh, and then we have the last one. And this is, uh, this is the, the one where Satan takes him to the highest temple, and he and Jesus look out at the world. And he tells Jesus, all of this that you see, I'll give it to you. All you have to do is, is kneel down and worship me. And Jesus doesn't go for it again. He realizes that all of these things are sharks. They want to interrupt his mission. They want to steer him off course. And this is his challenge. This is a testing that spirit puts him through. And so oftentimes when we have decided to make positive changes in our lives, we know that we desire something more in our lives. Okay? Uh, and we decide to make the changes so that we can have this greater good or we can express this greater good. We often find that energies come up, forces come up, people, situations happen that seem to, to block that good, that want to get us off course cause us to rethink or maybe to doubt our purpose, our desire. These things are sharks in my book. But just like Jesus, we have the opportunity to choose our response. There's a quote in your program that I placed here that I, uh, this one is from uh, Duke Tufte, the minister in Kansas City. And he said, even in the midst of the darkest of times, we have the power to choose the effect that a situation has on us and determine how we're going to respond. I think that is so true. I had a situation in my life where I was dealing with two different sharks at the same time. And uh, these sharks showed up when I was working at the pharmaceutical company in McPherson, Kansas. One of them was a crew member on one of the crews that I led, and the other was a supervisor that was over that crew. Um, what happened was there was a, a line called P48, and uh, it was a packaging line. And the line was having a great deal of difficulties. The, uh, the group leader there uh, was not a strong leader, and basically the crew did whatever they wanted. Uh, their production was, was, was low, their efficiency was awful, and uh, I got called by the manager of the plant, uh, and I was brought into a meeting with the, the group leader of that line and also that group leader's supervisor. And I don't know, I just kind of felt kind of embarrassed because the manager was telling me that he had asked that group leader and that supervisor to either step down or walk out the door because of how the P48 line was running. And of course, I'm thinking, well, what does that have to do with me? Okay. Uh, and then he asked if I would go to that line. And I'm thinking, do I have a choice? Okay. Not really. Okay. Um, I got a reputation for fixing lines that were in trouble having difficulties. Um, and so I was sent to P48. Uh, both that group leader and her supervisor opted to, uh, uh, to demote themselves. Um, both stayed at the company, but they were moved to other positions. And I went on to the line. And they brought in another supervisor for the line. And I'm going to call her Connie. And uh, of course, being called in to come and fix a line does not make a person the buddy 
usually of people on that line because there are things that have been, have been going on that have to change. One of the major things is that uh, they were used to going out for breaks and lunch and taking as long as they wanted. And the crew members would drift back to the line, one by one, maybe a couple, two. Uh, and the, the line was situated, being a packaging line, uh, there are different stations, and people do different things. A packaging line, some of them open up the cartons. This is a line that worked with little ampules, little glass tubes, okay, that, with a snap-off top that had medicine. Uh, and they were already filled on another filling line, but the packaging line had to label the, the ampules, uh, had to open up cartons and date, expiration dates on cartons, and all of these things were done by machines. Down the line, everyone had a job to do. They do their thing and pass it on, kind of like working at Tony's. Um, one summer, I took on extra work while I was working up there, and, and I did some part-time at Tony's, and I was on the pizza line where they put the pepperoni on the pizzas, okay? If you ever watched Lucille Ball uh, with that, that candy line that she was working on, that's kind of how I felt, okay? Uh, my pepperoni was going everywhere. The pizzas were coming to now, down the line fast. And being new, I wasn't, I wasn't used to it, okay? Uh, and I got accused of putting too much pepperoni on the pizzas, okay? And prior that, to that time, I wasn't really counting, one, two, three, four, five. I was taking a handful and... Okay. So uh, they learned me about that. Uh, and it was an interesting experience, okay? My hands began to freeze because these are frozen pizzas. The others, I couldn't stand, I couldn't hardly stand it, but they were doing it just fine. So they, uh, I was sent to an office and they, uh, they were sharing with me different kinds of gloves that I could try. So I said, well, I'll try that one and this other one. So I double gloved, whatever. We had gloves on anyway, but what I had wasn't doing it for me. Uh, the other thing was that you had to grab up, if you moved to a different station where you had to grab up these pizzas that got enclosed in the plastic, you had to grab up these things and you had to uh, open your hands like this, to grab them up, okay, and stack them. Okay. Okay. Uh, that was hard work, okay? That was really hard work. But this packaging line was kind of like that. Everybody had a station and everyone did their part. On down to the, the, the units being packaged in, in boxes, and then someone took the boxes and put them in shippers, okay? Uh, then they went down, they got taped, they got labeled, okay? Someone took them off and put them on pallets. Uh, and so everyone needed to be there for the line to run. If one station was missing, that line could not produce anything. Uh, and so what was happening is that not everyone was coming back from their breaks. So the, uh, the group would just sit, and they'd visit, and they'd play around, okay, waiting for the one or two who were late to come in. This caused their production to suffer. That was only one of the reasons why this group leader and her supervisor were asked to step down or step out the door. So here I am, and they brought me to this line, and it, it was tough knowing where to start. I had one of these gals, and I'm going to call her Debbie. She came up to me, and apparently she was quite angry that the company had demoted her beloved group leader. Uh, and what I realized is that she was quite attached to this individual, and uh, she was not happy about me being there and making changes because basically she and that group leader, they were in, I'd say, cahoots, okay? Uh, and Debbie experienced a lot of perks from that group leader, so much so that the other crew members were jealous and that led to bad feelings uh, and a difficult relationship there. Um, my thing was, I don't play favorites, I don't have favorites. I want to treat everyone the same with the same amount of respect. Um, and uh, when Debbie came up to me, what I, could, what I understood is that she was seeking to have the same kind of relationship with me that she had with the other group leader, and I don't play that game. Uh, and so uh, she quickly kind of turned on me. Uh, well, you know, I'm not there to be the buddy, okay? 
uh, I'm there to impress upon them that their work is valuable and they are valuable and to instill in them a sense of pride in the work that they do. Uh, but what happened after that is a new person came to the line. Her name was Rose. And Rose uh, loved to talk. And Rose was very angry about not getting a leadership position. And she was brought to my line and she basically told me she felt that she should have my job. And I wasn't quite sure how to take this. And I said, well, okay, you know, let's, let's just learn to work together. Uh, and um, she went online and she seemed to, she was the adversary for me. She was a shark. Uh, she resisted my line instructions, okay? And uh, I would leave, she would leave the room to go take care of uh, some, some work, some responsibility, and I, I would come back and everyone, the machines were shut off, and everybody was just sitting around listening to Rose tell her stories. Uh, and as I came back to the, I was in shock, okay? This happened several times. I called her up and spoke with her. More than this, these stories were sexual stories. And I had a young man online who was turning beet red. Uh, and I called Rose up and I said, uh, you cannot do this. You do not have the authority to shut this line down. We're in production. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is that the stories that you're telling of sexual nature, they can be considered harassment to this young man who's turning red. Okay. They are inappropriate for this environment. She got hot. She got hot. Now, I did not. I could have gone to tell the supervisor, she's shutting the line down. This is affecting production. Okay. I didn't. Uh, but I think that Debbie and Rose got the idea. They'll head to the supervisor's office. And they did, behind my back, and they made up stories. They told this supervisor, Connie, that I was being abusive to them, that I wouldn't let the crew talk, and they were doing their work. And, uh, and when I found out uh, by this, because Connie called me to the office, I just said, what? said, that is not true, okay? Let me tell you what's happening. She refused to listen to me. Uh, and that disturbed me because I didn't understand what's going on here. Uh, you are listening to these two, and what I realized is that they had been constantly going up, sharing all kinds of, of lies about me. And uh, uh, Connie did not, I said, well, if you don't want to listen to me, why don't you speak to, I had eight crew members, why don't you speak to the other seven of my crew and ask them what's going on? Ask them what the truth is. She refused to speak to any of them. And she just chose to take Rose and Debbie's word that I was abusive, wouldn't let them talk, they were doing their work, and I was whatever it was, okay? And I couldn't really believe this is going on. Now, uh, during that particular year, uh, before Rose came to the line, the company hired an outside company to come and give these personality tests and leadership tests of our leadership skills. So all of us in leadership positions took these tests. And as part of this, the crew members that we worked with were allowed anonymously to uh, give a report, to give an evaluation of our personality, our leadership skills, and whatever was else was on the report. And um, when mine came back, I was pleasantly surprised that there were seven excellent reports, and there was one that was a very negative report. And although there were no names attached, I knew exactly who had written the negative one. And I recalled that when I was first there, Debbie came up to me and said, I have never worked with a black person before. And I especially have never worked with a black person in authority over me, and I'm not sure I like it. And I said to her, well, let's just see how, how well we can work together. And I pretty much dismissed it, okay? Uh, but then I realized here we had Rose and Debbie teaming up here for whatever reason, I don't know, get rid of me, 
uh, replaced me. I, I wasn't sure what to do with that. Uh, but what, what happened was Connie began calling me up twice a week to give me a report on my behavior. Uh, I could not believe what was going on. She would say, well, I understand today that you've been pretty good with your crew. I said, Connie, let me tell you what's going. I don't want to hear it, okay? She left me no recourse. And, and, and meanwhile, these two were just having a, a bunch of fun on my line. Uh, and I went home crying a lot of times uh, and asking, I prayed, what can I do so that the light and the truth can come out about this situation? It's a dead end thing here. Um, and uh, what I realized is that report that had come out, the review earlier, I said, that's it. So I took that report to, well, I didn't have to, the, the manager of the plant, uh, I went to the manager of the plant, the one who hired Connie and placed her over the line that he'd also placed me on. And I told him what was going on on the line uh, and how Rose and Debbie were feeding untruths to Connie, and she was not even interested in listening to me or in talking to my crew to find out what was actually true. He read that report, and he saw the high regard that my crew members uh, gave to me. He called Connie and I to his office, and he demanded that she stop harassing me. Stop calling me into her office twice a week to give me a report on my behavior. Uh, you know, that felt kind of good. And he also said that whenever Debbie or Rose came to her with an issue, they were to speak to me so that we could work it out as adults. He had great confidence in my ability to work the situation out. And that was the answer there. That was how to deal with those sharks that I felt were attacking me in that situation. And uh, shortly after this, Rose was moved to another line. Uh, and then I heard that she had been fired. The supervisor on that line decided he was not going to put up with that stuff that she was doing on that other line, and he fired her. And I thought, yes. I thought, yes. Vindication again. And I thought about the scripture that says, just be there, and God will fight your battle. You will not have to fight the battle. God will take care of it for you. And this is what Jesus did. With those sharks, with those feelings, those, those, those beliefs, that attitude, that temptation, he turned it over to God. And so this worked out pretty good. Uh, Debbie, because she was not under Rose's influence, she learned to work with me and work with the rest of our crew. Uh, my crew members uh, had expressed during this time that they knew what was going on. They knew that Debbie and Rose were going up to Connie and telling lies. But they felt that they would be, what's the word where you're afraid to do something because you're afraid? Retribution. They thought that they would experience retribution if they went and told the truth. And I was sad about them not being willing to stand up for me. And then I realized, God is standing up for me. And it's really OK. And I let them know it's all right. Uh, they did not have to go up and, and uh, risk uh, being treated, mistreated. And what I learned here was that the, the strength, the empowerment that we need to move through, to challenge things that are difficult in our lives, to move through them, to overcome them. This is not given to us from out there. The ability to overcome is placed within us in that Christ presence in us, no matter whether it's something large or something small. Um, and I went on, I worked for the company 22 and a half years. And um, I got a reputation for being someone who could go to a troubled line uh, and get the crew communicating and working. Uh, and so the company used me in that way. 
Um, and sometimes it got to be a problem because, as I said to the manager, I would like to stay someplace after I've fixed it and we're working well. I would like to stay and enjoy the fruits of my labor. Oh, some other group leader, we got a new group leader here, she can handle that. We need you to go. M11, M5, M14, uh, P48, Tubbs, M6. Okay. Uh, wow. Uh, so at one time they made me a roving uh, group leader and I did not like that because I didn't have a crew to work with. It was someone else's crew. I'm patched in for a day or a week or that kind of thing here. And so I had no real relationship with them. Uh, so I didn't, didn't care for that. So um, uh, it was just how it was. I was good at what I did, and I made my crew feel good about what they did. And for me, that was most important. So uh, when sharks attack, we don't have to attack back. Okay? If we can stay open to divine guidance, we will be led, and the path will be made straight before us. So, God bless you. Whenever you are dealing with sharks in your own life, and let's experience a time of reflection now. <laughs>